Okay, uh, good morning and welcome to uh, Motivation Monday uh, with the British Sailing Team. Uh, very lucky today to have three guests uh, rather than just my normal two guests. And today's subject, um, we're talking about all about mental health, um, whether that be in performance sport or even the current situation we're in or in just in normal life really um, and around sailing. So I'm going to quickly go around the room and get people to introduce themselves and tell you who they are and uh, what they're doing um, at the moment and in wider life. Um, so if I go with my screen, I'll start bottom left. And that is uh, Sam. Do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us who you are, please. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Sam Cumming. I'm the EIS uh, Mental Health Manager. So look after um, all sports and high performance system from an EIS perspective in helping them look after mental health, um, predominantly for their athletes, but for their staff too. Fantastic. Uh, going top right now, Dan. <laughs> Yeah, hi guys. Uh, so my name's Daniel Budden. I'm a 49er sailor, obviously as part of the British sailing team, and I sail with James Woman. Uh, used to sail 29ers and then toppers before that. And yeah, at the moment we're in the um, P24 group uh, in Matilda 2024, so yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, I've got Hannah as well. Uh, hi everyone, I sail a radio um, with the British sailing team, so the single-handed female dinghy. Uh, aiming for Paris uh, 2024 as well. And like Dan, I am athlete rep for British Sailing. Cool. Would you would very quickly tell us a bit more what uh, what does the athlete what the athlete reps do for British Sailing? Yeah, so I've only been in the role since January, so relative newbie. Um, but it's it's a really cool sort of role actually. So um, we take feedback from athletes from various things and report back to management, and sometimes vice versa. Um, we do actually get to sit in on the management team meetings, which is really, it's really interesting. Um, and also I've just started being a bit more involved with the British Athlete Commission. They do quite a lot for um, athlete reps and we sort of take information from them and feed it back. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting role. It's athlete welfare, it's something I'm just really passionate about. So uh, I'm enjoying it. Great stuff. Okay, fantastic. So we're going to go on to then is um, we're going to start off with probably the big question really of, of what do we understand by by mental health. So that might be um, different from sound point of view to our athletes point of view. So I suppose what is mental health and, and what do we understand by it really? And I'm happy to go around the room again or see what people think. So we're back to Sam potentially on this one. I can give you our, our sort of definition of it um, and then and it'd be really cool to see how that fits with um, with uh, yeah, what Hannah and Dan think from an athlete's perspective. So um, Typically, when you talk to other people about mental health or anyone about mental health, they think about problems. So mental health problems like anxiety and depression and things like that. Whereas what we're trying to do through our work in the EIS is have a bit of a broader definition. So we're thinking about mental health problems as you know things that affect us um, that might be the things we typically think about um, in a negative way. Um, but then also positive mental health. So the ability to make a contribution to society, um, perform at our best. Um, and you know, just sort of yeah, perform well really. Um, and rather than also thinking of those as just good or bad, um, try and think of it as a, a continuum. So you've got mental health problems on one end, positive mental health at the other, and then we are constantly moving up and down this continuum of mental health, um, sort of depending on what happens over the course of a day, week, or month, or year, or something like that. So um, I, I typically think of mental health as something that we've all got, a bit like physical health, rather than just something that happens when there's a problem. Um, that's probably the bit of a textbook answer, but I'll, I'll hand it to the other guys to, to make it a bit more real. Okay, so is that as athletes then, what, what do you guys understand by mental health then? I think, um, I think kind of like spot on there, but I think more um, day to day, so like how I feel on a day to day basis. Um, like I think it's something that you can monitor, well, that I've been monitoring anyway. It's like, yeah, how you actually feel on a day to day, what you feel like doing or whatever, how does it align with like your values of the day and stuff. And, just kind of, I see it as something that you can very easily monitor. I think what I like about what you said was, it's not just bad. You can have good positive mental health as well. And I think it's recognizing that those good days, like recognizing that you do have the good days, otherwise you focus on all your bad days if you have them and then it kind of like spirals down. So I think, yeah, it's just knowing how you feel within yourself on a day-to-day -day basis, how that affects how you act as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like what both of you guys have said. I think um, so positive mental health is something that everyone should aim for and mental health is something that everybody has. Um, but I also I like the idea of it being a spectrum and that 
you do move up and down that spectrum and that's also okay so whilst you can aim for a really good men you know positive mental health um on a day-to-day -day basis it's okay that there will be some times or days where that won't be so great um but so from from my point of view i think the most important reason to aim for positive mental health is that it helps you to sort of be happy and productive in life but also that translates to your sport as well or your work if you you know you're not an athlete um so on days where you are feeling good and your mental health is is really positive then you will probably achieve more and be more productive so that's why it's so important to to maintain that kind of state of well-being i guess and it's you know, you've, you've all talked there about that kind of spectrum, the idea of actually, you know, trying to promote positive mental health or, or working where you are on that continuum. Just because you all seem to have, you know, obviously a pretty strong grasp of like considering where you are. As, as athletes, how long have you thought about it? Like when in your careers did you start considering that as a, you know, as actually that this is part of me or part of where I need to be? Is that a fairly recent thing since you've gone to the like high performance end or have you thought about that all, all the way through your careers? So I think like um, for me anyway, obviously I'm a bit younger and like I've just come out of like 29 is like three years ago. I think as you mature out of like the youth level, you definitely start to like recognize like not not like the problems or such, but like your actual mental health during your youth level. You think, why well, was I like that during that event? And then you realize like when, as you start to mature and think about it more and you're more exposed to it in the British sense, terms, we have like our, like our talks and stuff. And like you start to recognize how you acted when you're in youth level and you didn't like quite realize but i think what would be good if we could like try and connect that earlier i think it gets you a lot, a lot like a better foundations whereas you go into like the actual british sand team and i think like yeah for me it was as i started to mature as it were like into university i started to recognize it more just because there's more um i would say i think just like more strain almost on me because i had like university and i had this and that and it was like i kind of had to notice it because it was happening um so yeah for me that's kind of like how it was as it starts to mature it's like starts to be more aware of it i think I um oh sorry sam sorry sam uh really really cool to hear you describe that actually dan because that's the self-awareness is such an important part of of being of knowing where we are on that continuum if you can keep thinking about it in that way um in exactly the same way as, as hannah described it's it's really normal like for us to be moving up and down all the time but sometimes people find it harder to cope where they're not actually aware of where they are on this continuum. So the way you describe that uh, is really cool. Like the, the, the fact that you need the self-awareness and, and it takes a little while to develop. It's, it's not something that we all just have. So it's, it's a bit of a skill that we need to practice. Uh, we stay self-aware. And Hannah, has that, has that been, is that things like, you know, as you, again, to get towards performance and you've, you've been again, more self-awareness or something you've had all the way through your career, do you think? Being, being a bit older, thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 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 took, I took that as aimed at me, Anna. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Getting on a bit here. No, I think um, I think like like you both said, the I, I would call it like emotional intelligence, if you like. I think I've had a much better understanding of myself the the older I get, uh, mm -hmm. and that has translated to sure. sort of more consistent performances. Um, and I think looking back. I was probably well aware as a youth that I was having a bad race and I would be getting stressed or that my decision making would get more irrational potentially or, or you know my thought processes were sort of would unravel a little bit if I was doing badly in a race and I, I sort of knew that was happening but I probably couldn't have understood why or what I could have done about that whereas now I, I have more processes in place they don't don't always work um but i have more processes in place to deal with situations like that um so they become much more manageable yeah so, so yeah so yeah, it's again that kind of self-awareness or so you're now seeing it's part of your how you perform as as, as much as anything else really definitely and i think there are there are events i can sort of look back on um where i've had almost breakthrough moments in my sort of mental performance which have resulted in a breakthrough result um just in terms of processes that i've gone through to deal with setbacks or stressful situations or the way i've thought about um risk management in decisions even um and keeping that more calm so i think um just ha yeah having that greater sense of awareness has enabled me to 
come up with the processes that I need to come up with, which will be individual for everybody to deal with different situations. And, and Sam, do, do you think that's, that's something that athletes just get as they, as they, you know, move through the cycle and I don't want to keep his word now, but as, as they get older or is it, is it a something that, um, you know, they can act, actively start to look at a younger age, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think um, something we, we talked about before is um, sort of the, the importance of being able to be open and honest with each other. And I think generally in society, we're getting a little bit more comfortable with expressing our feelings and, and understanding you know, what we're feeling and, and um, sharing that with other people. That's a, quite a key part of this. There's some bigger sort of societal changes in people being more willing to be a bit more introspective and think about and understand how they feel. So there's some natural changes happening anyway. But I think... Um, yeah, we, we sort of learn through experiences, don't we? In a very similar way to what has uh, Hannah described, that you, you go through experiences and you reflect on them and learn from them. Um, so you probably do need some life experience to, to help you along the way. But at the same time, I think it's something that we're generally becoming a bit better at doing is talking about how we feel and, and noticing how we feel. Okay. So, um, so we can talk a bit about uh, you know, what it is or, or what we understand by it and also kind of like where, where awareness of it started to come in. Um, I suppose that the next question which leads on to really is, you know, and Hannah's already mentioned this idea of having some processes and some ways of, of you know, of working through things or trying to promote positive mental health. You know, you know, what, what can you do to make sure you start, you're either at the positive end or if you're going towards the negative end to, to help you out of that back towards the positive end? So what, what are your processes to try and um, promote positive mental health? So I'd say I have, I have different ones in terms of state of well-being in life compared to potentially positive mental health impact in my performance. So just generally in life, I think the ability to switch off is really important. I'm not very good at it. <laughs> I think that's, that's definitely a weakness of mine. And I almost have to schedule those moments in. Uh, and then I sometimes have to get family and friends to prompt that as well. Um, so yeah, just making sure that you're in touch with you know the people that you, you care about that's really important especially at the moment um but also i do have hobbies outside of sport you know i i play music and i love that and i don't make enough time for it um so i do try to schedule moments in for for those things um and also just fresh air so important again especially at the moment making the most of my um hour a day of government authorized exercise um outside it's just fresh air is just really good for the soul i think um but for, from a performance point of view um i'd say i have quite different um processes in place for different situations um so for setbacks i think um that would be quite different to how i would approach um like decision making if a race was going badly and so uh if, if i was in a race and it was it was going particularly particularly pear shaped um, had that in the worlds last year. So it was the um, final race of the regatta. I'd already used my discard and it would have been the difference between top 10 and coming 20 something because I was 50, 50 something around the top mark and I had to get it back. And I just kept going through in my mind because it was really shifty conditions. Like there's still lots of opportunities here and just that positive mental mental talk you know there are still opportunities there's still opportunities for reward here um and i did get it back and and got the top 10 but i think um recognizing it wasn't all over till it's over all of those all those little positive self-talk is really important for me in races uh, and if i do find myself going into like negative self-talk which can spiral then recognizing that is the absolute first stage like the longer you take before you recognize that certainly for me the worse it gets so if i can nip that in the bud as soon as those thoughts come into my head that's that for me is really important and are you like with that idea of like positive self-talk or you know just keep your mind open there's loads of opportunities here is that almost like you like pre-programmed in before racing go right you know if this happens that's that's my go-to that's what i'm trying to look for or is that just something that you've you've slowly kind of crept into over time i think it it's something I've crept into over time, but I have to consciously do it. Um, so getting into a little negative spiral was, I mean, I'm sure everybody does it, but I, I became aware, certainly, especially through last year, um, 
that I could get in into that spiral and it would be, you know, oh, maybe I'm slow or uh, my decision making is not on point today. Uh, and they would sort of build. Uh, and the quicker you could realize, the better. But then what I tend to go back to is experiences where the negative things that I'm saying to myself weren't actually true. So, but you know, you're quick in this stuff because the last time you were training, you were coming out of the rabbit runs and you were, you were winning them all, or, you know, whatever that is that, that is relatable to you. So I would say that positive self-talk and confidence can come from like, your own experiences. And that, that for me is the best way of, of getting myself out of that sort of neg negativity. Yes, it's based, so it's actually based, it's based on fact, isn't it? Which is pretty strong. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then your little yeah. demon in your head can't argue because yeah. it's like, well, go away. You know, you can't, it's not true. So, so you can leave now. Uh, yeah. yeah, if it's based on fact, you can't argue with it. Cool. How, about, how about you, Dan? Yeah, I think what Hannah said there was like pretty key about the first thing about actually like separating the two. So like your performance lifestyle and obviously your actual lifestyle. So I was saying like Hannah said, it's really... I'm similar, like, I can't stop. I, I do so much, I can't stop. I want to do the next thing. And it's like finding that downtime, whether it's literally 10 minutes of just sitting there, phone off, doing nothing, whether it's like reading. But I think, like, a massive thing, we're so connected in today's society with like notifications and stuff. A massive thing for me, it might not be for everyone, like, for everyone was just like, I always feel like I have to reply to everyone on my phone, but literally, like, turning my phone off for like 30 minutes and just thinking, I don't have to reply, I don't have to be connected to anyone for that time go for a walk, listen to a podcast or whatever, or some music and just having that time out, it's like massive. Just because one, it gives you time to reflect and also just to get away from it all, that kind of thing. And like a bit of relief. Um, and then secondly, like into the performance lifestyle stuff, um, like kind of, it's a bit different for me because obviously I've got James on the boat as well. But it's definitely before you go into your performance, like when you're in training stuff, it's like having those processes in place. So we're like quite simple as it were in the fact that if we're on a race course, like, if it's, going to, if it's going well, then you're going to be in a good mindset. Like we're, if it's going well for us, we're, we're just bang, bang, next on, next, next decision, this, that, that. And it's all flowing. But it's very, like, you have to be aware of when it goes wrong, what you're going to do. And, like, for us, it's just fact versus fiction and the next right decision. And we're literally just, like, if we go on the bottom mark, because, obviously, the situation on the race course where, for example, James might have made a bad decision or I might have made a bad decision. And the first thing for a double-handed boat is, trust and just being like um okay we're both going to make wrong decisions don't blame each other for it like that's just part of it so it's like you can't be like oh my god you've made that decision and then be like hang on it's just being like okay that's happened okay next right decision and sometimes it's one of us has to tell the other so for example if i'm angry for one point maybe i've like messed up attack or something james would be like no nah, reset next right decision or we go on the bottom mark and james is like we're all going like bottom mark. There's loads of boats. There's lots going on. I'll just come out the mark like okay, next right decision. I'm going lift or lift or header kind of thing, and it'd be like just a constant reset. And um, we talk a lot about it in the like the talks and stuff about that reset button on a race course because like the main thing is is like Hannah said, recognizing when you're in these positions, and like if you can do that and you have a process to be like okay, next right decision, which is like our reset or okay this is what it needs to do now, kind of little facts versus fiction, if we're a bit confused of what's going on, what's actually happening, what do we think is happening, and then just like working off that. I think, yeah, it's all about having knowing, knowing when you're in that situation and having a process to get out of it is massive. The bits that were really cool for me actually hearing that were, were that fits really neatly with some of the stuff we've been working on um, from the EIS perspective on um, what are the sort of the four key areas of promoting positive mental health? So I'm thinking sort of widely beyond your performance, um, but obviously the, the impact on your performance is, is there as well. Um, so we talk about um, having connections with others, um, being able to be independent, make informed choices and be, be autonomous. Um, and then the two that I think really closely connected with what we were talking about there was the um, importance of recovery, self-care, whether that's having a bit of downtime, the way you described down switching your, switching your connectivity off for a bit um, or whether it's being able to get out into nature have some have some space um, and some fresh air um, and then also developing the whole person so looking at the stuff that is outside of your sport so that you're not just doing your sport all the time there's some there's some other things that you do or some other interests that you have which again I think Hannah touched on earlier um, so the, the, in those four different areas um, we sort of focus on those to try and get people to to encourage and promote positive mental health and head down that green end of the continuum 
um, they're obviously all interconnected. And if you do loads of connecting with other people, then you have to find the right balance with then how you get your self care and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and these things are really in, individual for, uh, for, for each other. I think um, the bit as well for me that, that sticks out is on the, on the self care side, on the recovery side, particularly when you're in dad's position where you're, you're competing with someone or you're working, you know, you're working with someone in competition. It's really important that each of you know what, what you both need for your self care. So we've given some great examples of how that works in a race setting or in a training setting where you have your reset button and you, and you work together while you're competing. Um, but also, you know, know what you need when you're off the water and how you switch off. So you might be in a situation where one person really likes to be fully connected and keeping in touch with you all the time and checking in with you and asking you questions and, and wanting to, to sort of be chatting all the time. Whereas another person wants just a bit of space and be able to go out and have a walk, but having those conversations with the people that you, that you do your sport with or that are in your life as well, knowing what you need from them and, and how you need it to sort of yeah, manage your self care is really important too. Yeah. I think the massive thing that you said there was um, just like with like me and James and stuff like over the years that like we've sat together for like eight years now uh, and like during youth level, we never really talked about, like you said, off the water and like how we actually speak to each other and uh, interact because like your best mates, you're having a great time. And when it goes wrong, it's kind of awkward. You're like, oh, what do you say now? Kind of thing. Um, whereas now it's like before a regatta or anything like that training or anything it's always like look my door's open if there's anything wrong just tell me because then on the water we know because you can have bad days because something's gone wrong like thing goes, things go wrong in life and like it does affect you and like a massive thing for us was just like telling each other because then you know how that guy that person's feeling like okay they might be having a bit of an off day and like at least you know that so you go on the water and you kind of and you know what they want from that you know and like you can still be productive um, so yeah, I think it's just like, especially because I'm double-handed, anyone who's double-handed out there, it's like just being able just to talk to your to partner. It might be awkward at first, and it is, like, it's quite hard sometimes to tell people how you feel, but like, the more and more you do it, the easier it gets, and the better it is for your performance, for sure. And I mean, in terms of, you know, that, so I suppose going on from uh, what Dan and Sam have both said there, you know, that thing of, um, yeah, recognising what you need in terms of support. So Dan, yours is, is yours having that conversation, isn't it? Straight away. I mean, you know, I suppose Hannah and Dan, like, you know, if you, if you are having that tough time, what's your, you know, you're happy to share what you're going to go to, you know, support is for helping you get out of that once you're off the water. Yeah. So I think just because you're single handed doesn't necessarily mean that you can't tell like your coach or if you're having a bad day. And I think, you, sh you know ideally you still show up to training but I've definitely had times before where I've just said to my coach before I go on the water I'm I'm not really feeling this today I'm not motivated or whatever that is uh and then we have that frank conversation of right well how are we actually still going to make this productive um like what can we do to make this a productive day and come away thinking that we've achieved something so you know the coach is really important as a go-to but then once you've come off the water I think there's probably a handful of people where if I'm just having a really tough time, whether that's during a regatta or whatever, that I would just pick up the phone. Um, and it could just be to talk about just normal stuff away from sport, which is actually quite refreshing sometimes. Or it could be sometimes it's just, I just need to rant at someone that this regatta is going really badly for five minutes and then we'll switch off and we'll talk about something different. So I, if I do feel like I need to have that rant, there's sort of a few people that I can rely on that I could give, give them a call and say, look, this has all gone really badly and I can just offload for five minutes, but I will set myself a time limit because otherwise you could just go on forever and that's not helpful either. <laughs> um, but, and then we'll move on to other things and right, what are you going to do about it? Okay, here's, here's the plan. Um, let's talk about things that are away from sport and then you can get a bit distracted. So I think having that network of, of people, it doesn't need to be many people, but who you can just rely on to have those kind of, really difficult sort of almost ranting phone calls with and they understand and that it's just part of part of sport and that you know it's it's not you and you'll you'll feel better tomorrow when, or once you've had the chat that's, that's just not necessarily trying to fix it for you they're just just there to help listen to you offload it really yeah but interestingly by being there they do help fix it yeah that's such a great point sam like that 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 um being clear about what you need and what you want from the conversation and actually a lot of the time exactly as you say Hannah the ability to just offload onto someone or just to share a problem with someone 
you don't need them to be fixing things for you you just need them to listen and that's what was really cool about what you you described there was actually setting the conversation up as that i don't want you to fix any problems for me i just need you to listen to me for five minutes while i rant that really helps the person who's listening because they you know it's like if someone says oh can i just have a chat with you for a second in your head you're thinking okay well how how, what do i find out what's wrong how do i fix this for them if you set that conversation up as this is what this is what I want from you for five minutes. I just want you to be a listening ear and, and I can just rant at you for a bit and that helps them help you sort of thing. Um, the other bit as well, I think when we're thinking about self-care and how we look after ourselves and the people that we connect with, whether that's your coach or with a person on the end of the phone that you, you call into, it's, um, it's making them aware that they're important to you in that way. So, you know, whether it's a friend at home, being a bit explicit to say, look, just I hope you realise that when I'm when I'm away, it's really helpful for me to be able to call you, and that's you're, you're someone that I think about when I am having a hard time that I I've got in my back pocket that I can call. Making them aware of that is really really good because it's worth it's a nice thing to hear, but it also helps them to understand why they might be making making contact why you might be making contact with them, um, and and using them you know to help your performances. Yeah, and I think the other really important thing is um, if you're if you are worried about calling someone or you know. I, the way I always try to look at it is if they were in trouble or they were having a hard time and they didn't feel like they could call me, mm. how would that make me feel? And I'd be devastated. So actually, if you turn that round, like you, sh- you shouldn't ever worry about giving someone a call. Yeah. And I suppose, so just stick on that idea of like support. So, you know, there's, you know, their support from a coach or you know, support from that friend that's been able to take that phone call. Um, in In terms of, you know, wider support you know, what what is there out there or what what other options have, have, have people got if they've if they've got some challenges or they, they need a bit of extra support i can probably from a um probably more from a program perspective from you from from the athletes that are on program they've obviously got yeah. their psych and pl support which which these guys can speak to a bit more specifically i guess um but there's beyond your coach your your teammates you've then also got people around um that that setup who can have sort of some of those conversations that become quite helpful potentially doctor as well um and again thinking on the program side you've you've then got roots into um if, if it's that deeper level of concern and needing um a bit more a higher level of support from a mental health practitioner athletes that are on a certain level of um funding have access to uh, the athlete medical scheme which means they can have referrals for for uh, you know, mental health practitioners to see them and, and do some interventions with them there. So that's a that's probably quite a unique position to be in from a program perspective. For the wider um, population of, of British sailing uh, membership, there's there's all sorts of different stuff, and it's always worthwhile being aware of what's available to you through work. So lots of places have um, an employee assistance program. Typically, there'd be six sessions of counselling that you, that you could do, or something, or someone at the end of a phone to talk to who's independent. You've got all sorts of organisations like the Samaritans, um, Mind, have got an info line, lots of places you can speak to to just have a conversation with someone. Because sometimes when we're really having a hard time, it feels easier to speak to someone who doesn't know us or is away from the situation. So um, it's important to be aware of, of the sort of listening services that are available to you. Um, and then if we're, we're talking about a real concern, we're down at that sort of red end, red end of the continuum uh, towards the mental health problem end, then it's, it's speaking to a GP. Um, maybe using the IAP screen, so improving access to psychological services, which is an online service that you can Google in your local area and find out um, how to get access to that. So there's there's lots of different ways of accessing support, I guess, graded on your level of concern. Um, so that, yeah, I thought I'd chuck that in quickly first yeah. as a sort of formal one, but yeah, be keen to hear from the other guys as well. I think like um, what you said there is like loads of avenues, but like the main thing is just like recognizing if there is a problem, like everyone has their ups and downs, like I'm up and ups and downs. And like when you actually access that support and you know it's there and like recognize that it's like becomes a lot easier, like just to talk to people, etc. like that. And I mean, like for me, it's, um, I mean, I go straight to my mum. Like if I have an issue, I will literally ring her straight away and like she'll be on the end of the phone and she will just, she knows exactly how to act because I've done it so many times. It's just, setting up those calls and having those people that you can talk to but it's all about like recognizing you're in that position no matter what position it is maybe it's a good day and you want to talk to someone about it and just like boast about it. i don't know maybe it's, well, it's really a bad day but it's having that recognizing like okay no there is something wrong it's fine to tell people like you'll be amazed that like everyone has their ups and downs and it's like just being honest with yourself 
and just talking to people about them and you'll feel so much better about it like the weight that lifts off your shoulders is just like it's unspeakable like it's happened so many times to me where i've literally rang my mum and said me like look this is how i feel like this and it just literally lifts off you and you're like oh my gosh thank you kind of thing so i think it's just like recognizing that and just being happy to talk to people about it and it will like i say it will be hard initially but it just becomes a lot easier to do and it's yeah i think it's just great once you get it down i think the, the really positive thing about that though is it's being that's being proactive and yeah. having those proactive conversations when you're noticing that you're you know starting to have you've got a bad day and you just want to share it and offload with someone it 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 helps to mitigate against that sort of accumulation of lots and lots and lots of bad days becoming overwhelming um and maybe does that's kind of what does stop you going down to the sort of further red end of the of the scale but as you say it's you know we live in a, a complex world even without the the weird situation we're in at the moment um it's normal that we're going to be bouncing up and down that continuum and, and the stuff that we can put in place the proactive stuff having the conversations with people knowing what we need getting outside is all the stuff that can help us when we do go down that end sort of help us work our way back up again so i suppose so coming on to that i suppose it's the, it's the kind of elephant in the room we should speak about we're obviously all in a you know everyone's in this weird unique situation at the moment um and, and probably you know actually um it's one of those times where you know trying to stay in, in positive mental health is as important as it's ever been so you know what are your, what are your current top i think everyone's fascinated to know what what people are doing at the moment to um try and keep themselves down that kind of positive end of mental health so what, what are your top tips at the moment what, what are you all personally doing to to stay down the positive end of things you want to take it away all right so uh i think i'm quite a big list person so i've got my little weekly list and routine of what i'm going to be doing at every point in the week uh and then i can't kind of deviate from it so it just keeps me busy so i'd say routine is really important um we're really fortunate that british sailing have put on like sail from home programs so we have various sort of lectures and zoom calls and things like that um which is great because it brings everyone together and you get to see some faces. Um, so enjoying that element of it. Um, I had knee surgery about 11 weeks ago or so. Um, so I'm quite busy doing knee hab, rehab. Um, so I've got quite a lot of that to do and I converted my garage, just bought my first house, very exciting, but converted my garage to a gym. So I've got a few bits and pieces in there. So it keeps me busy doing a, quite a lot of uh, rehab stuff during the days. Um, also started learning French, Paris 2024. So uh, Maddie, who's a kite surfer, um, has a degree in, in languages and French. So uh, we're doing a little tutorial once a week and then I go away and do my homework. Um, so yeah, just try, trying to keep busy with lots of sort of bits and pieces really. Um, but I'd say routine is, is the main one and also just making time for that that downtime and connecting with people um so i do a weekly virtual folk club with all my folk club friends from home <laughs> um, which is which is entertaining uh and i've done a few um quizzes and things like that which has been fun via zoom so uh it's about trying to keep busy and productive but keep some fun as well definitely go for my week uh, my daily walk fresh air very important um but yeah routine i think is key for me okay cool cracky uh what about you sam what are you, what are you doing um very yeah, very similar to anna um although french lessons sound really cool i think um that i could be better use, yeah making better use of my time than, than just uh, watching netflix a lot of the time i could be learning french um yeah i think the big thing for me uh, similar to routine but it's being boundaried with your routines as well so making sure that you are um i think it's different for different people isn't it but we're spending a lot of time in front of the screens and a lot of time in meetings and and, and speaking on online and stuff like that it's, it's, and that has quite a big tax on your uh, your brain i think just not having the personal connection but being behind the screen so trying to be boundaried about i mean i've done boring things like putting half an hour's break into my diary each day for taking lunch so i actually stop and go outside or do something rather than just sit and plow through a whole day's worth of work and then try and end the day with something so I'm not, i'll try and go out for a run or go out on my bike at the end of the day because at the moment home is the office as well as home so it's important to try and separate those two things out a bit um but also i think there's some there's some cool stuff we could be doing on just what changing our thinking a little bit and 
seeing how what we can use this time as in a positive way so seeing the opportunity that we've got by you know we can't get out and i, I guess for you guys particularly it's, it's really tough with sailing where i guess you're you're really restricted on, on not being able to do your sport specifically so it'd be easy to get focused on the negatives of that but then there's also opportunities to do something else have a bit of a break work on yourself um outside of, of sailing um or uh, or you know train some of the aspects that, that you wouldn't do normally so that's yeah i think that's a, a cool thing to do is see how you can change your perspective on it um the the other one the, the tip i've got from um someone from art said the eis have got an expert a mental health expert panel when at the beginning of this we had a a call to say what are some of the, the key things we should be considering one of the ones that they um suggested was thinking about the uh the quantity and quality of the information you're taking in so it's really easy to get overwhelmed at the moment with just everything on twitter everything on the internet everything on online is is showing you telling you how, what a disastrous situation we're in and how bad it's going to be or when it's going to be over so trying to limit your your flow of information a bit more so making sure that you've got it from high quality sources so either direct from the, the daily bulletin on, on uh, from the BBC or something, just the first 10 minutes of that, and then the right quantity as well. So you're not just con constantly being bombarded by um, coronavirus stuff, but you're actually able to check in, keep informed, but then carry on living your life with your routines as Hannah described. Cool. How about, how about you, Dan? Yeah, so like a lot of like what this, like you said there about like the routine stuff's like massive. Uh, I call it like win, win the morning and like the rest of the day kind of falls into place. So I have like a really like strict kind of morning routine where it's just like you get up, you know, like, you know, you do like a bit of exercise. Um, I like read for like half an hour, whatever, like go out and do breakfast, have like, do my emails. And then it's like doing that little tiny routine, which could literally be like half an hour, will set you up really well for the day. I think like what we've all said there, it's just like having a bit of structure and routine, like having something to do during the day. I think for like specifically sailing, there's a lot of things that you say, oh, I should, I could, should, I should do that, but I uh, can't really be bothered. It's like admin kind of thing. And like, there's a lot of stuff that you can get done now that you wouldn't be able to do before. And then there's also like education on sailing, like all the dynamics behind sailing, aerodynamics and all that is like massive in that you can schedule in maybe 45 minutes a day uh, to that specific thing. And then you could schedule another 45 minutes into something else. Like reading or just another education. I mean, I've taken on like um, two or three online courses at the moment, and like they're, they're out there that they're, those are free ones at the moment as well, like really cheap ones that you can take, which will just add a bit of structure into your days. And like we've said there, it's like thinking about what else you like outside of maybe your performance sport, and like you can give a bit of time to that. Um, another one's massive, like I think what Sam said about how it's like actually a massive opportunity to actually think, like you've got all this time just to think about what all the structure in your life like what's going to happen like what you want to set yourself goals wise how it's going to look etc and you can really take this time to just have a little think about what you're going to do and like you can start implementing things now that are going to really make you succeed out, 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 like, off the back of this um, and then another thing was about owning i call it like owning my own time so like don't like have what you want to get out of this lockdown period i've made like a 96 day plan and then you can like re reevaluate kind of thing what do you want to get out of this 96 days and like actually own your time. So don't let anyone else like ring you up like off through the day to like try and like take away that bit of time if that's on something else. And like having that and like scheduled in, it just makes it a lot easier to be focused and not like actually feel productive. Because I mean, I can literally get to points where I could be on a messenger video call, come off that, go onto a Snapchat video call, come off that, go onto a Zoom call. And it's like, gets in the day and you're like, oh, I've just been great socializing, but I've just got nothing what I wanted to do in the day. So I think it's like, yeah, having what do you want to get out of this lockdown period and then actually like start to structure it? Cause I mean, yeah, like I said, I've got a morning routine that I'll always do every day and I've got little courses here and there and it's slowly you start to fill up and you put in hour of exercise, et cetera. And you'll find like, actually you've got a bit of structure going forward. And then yeah, like Sam said as well, just making sure you've got that downtime. Like I have that 30 minutes reading every morning. So that if I do nothing else in the day, at least I've read the 30 minutes kind of thing. Like I've had that downtime and it's like, um, yeah, massively important just to have that bit of time off in structured in there because if you're like me, it's quite easy to fill my day with loads of tasks. Um, but then it's like actually, you need to have some kind of downtime in there. But the structure kind of helps that. So yeah, routine and keep yourself busy. What do you want to get out of this 96 days or whatever? I just I 
I think now Tiger King on Netflix is, is <laughs> yeah. good. So, you know, that's, a, that's a big achievement to have done that. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, take yeah. that. Get that, get that done. Brilliant. Really, um, well, sorry, go on, Anna. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, I think it's a bit of a balance, isn't it, between like wanting to achieve things and actually also recognizing those achievements so i bought myself a whiteboard for my garage gym and i've got little goals on there and i tick off you know little milestones when i've got to them uh and you can just see progress then and i just think it's really important even if it's just to write down in the evening like three things you've achieved that day so i think it's quite easy because you're in the same place all the time to feel like you haven't done anything and actually you look back and think oh no like i i have actually i've done quite a lot today um but also just to not put too much pressure on yourself if you are having a bad day because it is a crazy time and for lots of people you know you're not seeing people not face to face anyway and that that is hard so if you are having a, a bad day that that's okay um so one one thing that I saw I saw a good quote a few days ago actually or, and I just thought for, for me it resonated for some people it might not but it just said it's not about motivation it's, it's about discipline and for me, that was really important because there were some days where I was feeling pretty demotivated and that's really rare for me. And I was like, okay, you might not be motivated, but if you go to the gym and do it anyway, then you've really achieved something. And that actually kind of got me going into that routine again. So I guess it's just about finding what works, what works for you, but um, just recognizing the little achievements that you are making every day. Yeah, there's, there's two things. So completely sums up exactly what i was thinking as, as we were having that discussion was so that was, that was really cool to hear that was um we've been talking about um getting people to think about what they want what they what they want to look back on this period of lockdown as so what very very related to dan's points about what what do you want to have achieved um and that can help with that sort of more positive focus on rather than just thinking about the bad things or just sat in front of netflix all day it's thinking about when you look back on this period what do you want to have achieved but at the same time balance it with let's be realistic this is a really weird situation we're in it's pretty unprecedented and nobody really knows how to act and then there's quite a lot of uncertainty as well it's really normal for us to have bad days we think about that again go back to that continuum sound like a broken record it's normal that we're going to be up and down it all the time more than we would do normally because it's there's a lot of uncertainty and again for that reason that's why it's really important to recognize that the people that we interact with so the our work colleagues our training partners our coaches um everyone's situation is slightly unique you've got some people that are at home with um with kids you've got some people who've got family members on the front line or who are concerned about an elderly relative so everyone's in a slightly different situation as well so we're all experiencing it slightly differently so again another tip i'd, I'd have would be really try and be as empathetic as you can with the people that you interact with because where you might be having a really good day the person that you're catching up with might be having a, a really hard time as well um even though we're experiencing much the same thing um, so yeah it's uh it's do all those positive things but also do them with empathy and uh, and with a sort of recognition that it's a weird time we're in and it's normal for us to feel a bit weird brilliant um i think that's that that rounds up really nicely actually so um i'll say massive massive thanks to all three of you so uh sam hannah uh dan um uh, thank you very much um i hope you like keep those routines going through the rest of lockdown and fingers crossed we'll be back on the water very soon <laughs>